and welcome to Wild for Scotland, a podcast full of inspiring stories from Scotland. I'm your host, Cathy Camleitner. Wild for Scotland helps you connect with Scotland and dream about future adventures. I'll tell you immersive stories to whisk you away, share some of my top tips for your own Scotland trip, and introduce you to inspiring locals and their stories. So lean back and enjoy. Let's travel to Scotland. We are back with another story this week, and it's one I've been looking forward to sharing with you for a long time. I'm taking you to my favourite place in Scotland. I know, I know. How could I possibly pick one favourite, right? There are many places in Scotland that I truly love, and if you'd ask me to make a list of my top 10, I'd really struggle. But the number one on that list, that is taken, without a doubt, by Glencoe. It's the first place I visited outside of Glasgow, and probably the one I've been to most since then. It was here that I went on my first hike in the Scottish Highlands, celebrated a very special birthday, and two years ago, I actually got married in Glencoe. It's a very special place that is near and dear to my heart, so when Adam Raja suggested it as a place to meet and record our interview, I was all in. Adam is a photographer, an avid mountaineer and a climate advocate, and you'll hear more from him next week. Unfortunately, he wasn't actually able to join me for our hike in Glencoe, so I ventured out on my own, on a trail he recommended. Let's travel there together. This is where it all began. Do you remember the moment you fell in love with Scotland? I posted this question on my Instagram account a few years ago and loved watching the answers pour in. Stories of overwhelming emotions, tears of joy and moments of strength. For some it was a specific place, for others it was an encounter with locals or traces of their ancestors. But the thing they all had in common is that they all remembered the exact moment the moment of falling in love that it's impossible to prevent. I clearly remember mine. I was sitting on top of a hill in Glencoe. It was my first time venturing out of the city, less than two weeks after moving to Scotland. I'd joined the university's mountaineering club, and this was the first of many weekend trips I would join that year. A few moments ago, I emerged on top of this hill, with tense hands and shaky legs, We had climbed the weeping wall on the east face of Anoch Dub, one of the dramatic peaks you'll see as you drive through the glen. I'd only started rock climbing a few days ago, and this was my first attempt of climbing outside. I'd lost my balance a few times, and even though I was attached to a top rope, I was absolutely terrified. I ignored everything around me and focused on getting to the top. It didn't even occur to me to turn around and look at my surroundings. So when I eventually pulled myself onto the final ledge of our climb, sat down and looked up, my jaw nearly hit the ground. I was looking at the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. The Anach Igach. The Anach Igach is a dramatic ridge that frames the north of Glencoe. Our side of the glen was already in the shade, but the setting sun out west dipped the ridge in a rose-gold hue. I looked at the mountains across the glen, the patchwork of colours of still green grass and bracken slowly turning orange. Grey rock and scree-covered slopes. Dark lines where shadows revealed treacherous gullies and sudden drops. It looked majestic, and it was this moment that I knew I had made the right choice to move to Scotland. The moment when it all began. This was home, and one day, I'd climb that ridge. Eight years later, that moment finally came, and I really did make my way up and across that ridge. But today, as I find myself back in the glen, I'm taking on a slightly less challenging route.
Every time I drive through Glencoe, I'm in awe. I can never just drive straight through. I always have to stop at least once to soak in the views and remind myself of that feeling I had on my first trip here. Today, I pick a lay-by near the Glen Etiff Road. Buckletive Moor looks like a pyramid from this angle. A thin layer of clouds is draped around its peak and have no doubt that once it lifts, it will leave a thin dusting of snow behind. The sun is shining, the fresh mountain air is ice cold. A few miles later, I pull into the Beehive car park, put on my hiking boots and set off on a path leading up towards the hills on the south side of the Glen. The route I'm following was recommended to me by a photographer and climate advocate. It's a simple but pretty route that goes between the mountains rather than up, he said. Um, and it actually goes around the back of two of my favourite hills. But it's really beautiful and there's loads of wildlife. I'm um, really sorry I couldn't be there with you. Perfect for a solo hike. The route is called the Two Larics. Larrick means pass in Gaelic, so it's the trail of two passes that connect Glencoe with Glen Etif. It's about nine miles long. First you walk south and cross the first pass, then you swing slightly east and back north across the other pass, back to where you started. Another way to look at it is that it's a loop around Buckletif Bake, one of the Munros of Glencoe. But that's by far not the only mountain you get a good look of on this trail. Not five minutes into my hike, I spot a small track leading off onto a knoll and follow it. The ground is wet and my boots squelch as I find my way across the mud. As I emerge on top of the hill, I'm thrown back in time to that moment when I emerged from my climb. The Anach Igach is sprawled out in front of me and everything looks golden. The grass has dried out and taken on a yellow tinge and the bracken has the colour of burned ochre. The beaming sunlight creates the illusion of a golden blanket draping the glen. Clouds hide the very top of the ridge, but the slopes below are shimmering in the morning sun. It's that kind of view that brings me back to this glen over and over again. Back on the main path, I continued to make my way up the glen. I barely noticed the trail leading left towards the ascent of Buckletif Bay. I'm drawn in the right direction by an invisible pull. Soon, a river comes into view. It's one of the waters that flows towards Glencoe and tumbles down a waterfall called the Meeting of the Three Waters. Together they form the River Co, which eventually pours into Loch Leven. But the waterfall is also known as Tears of MacDonald's, named after the Clan MacDonald that was brutally murdered by the Clan Campbell during the Glencoe Massacre in 1692. I can't see the waterfall from up here though, just a mumbling river and a path continuing on the other side. The water is a couple of metres wide, and as far as I can tell, about knee-deep, at worst. I take off my shoes. I had read that this hike requires several river crossings, none of which offered a bridge, and I knew it was going to be wet and boggy on the path, but for now, I wanted to keep my boots dry. With my boots in one hand, and the other free for balance, I take a step forward. The water is ice cold, and the skin on my feet feels like it's burning. Weirdly enough, I'm actually enjoying it. 
With every step, the muscles on my lower legs tense and relax. The water covers my feet and then my ankles. I slowly edge my way forward, trying to step on rocks that lift me a little higher out of the water, testing their surfaces to avoid slipping and falling. I'm almost across the river as I get to the deepest spot. The water creeps further and further up my lower legs until it reaches the bottom of my rolled up trouser legs. It's okay, I think. Just one more step and I'm across. I reach for a rock with my left foot, lean forward, find grip for a second and then lose it immediately. Without thinking, I stretch out my left arm, attached to the hand holding my boots, and use it to stabilise myself, while dumping my boots into the water. Realising what I had just done, I quickly rise up, make a final leap, and reach the other side. I sit down on a rock, still hopeful that my shoes remained mostly dry, and at the same time aware that that was just wishful thinking. I reach in to retrieve the socks, two soggy piles of fabric, and wring them out. Below them, small ponds have formed on the bottom of my boots, and all I can do is turn them around and watch the water trickle to the ground. Not quite the result I had hoped for, but at least the rest of me was dry, and I hadn't hurt myself. Reluctantly, I put on my wet socks, tie my shoelaces, and continue on the trail. My feet were going to get wet anyways. Might as well get it over with. The path takes me further up into the glen, but I barely notice the gradual ascent. I'm too distracted by what's around me. A small herd of deer is gathered on the slopes to my right, around ten does grazing and resting in the tall grass. Above them, I can see the Bainfather Ridge, the easternmost of the three sisters, that leads towards one of the Monroe peaks of this mountain. Over on the other side, to my left, I'm starting to see the further away peak of Baculative Big that I climbed a few years ago. And ahead in the distance, a thin veil of clouds is moving through the glen, hanging low among the peaks. It's not hard to see why anyone who hikes here would fall in love with Glencoe. It's beautiful from the roadside, yes, but it's here among the mountains that you can get a sense for the true scale of this landscape and be overcome by awe. And yet I can't help but be overcome with a feeling of sadness too. These glens are not supposed to be this empty. I don't know if there was a settlement here at some point in the past and I've not seen any ruins so far, but I wouldn't be surprised if this glen was once alive with crofts and townships. But it isn't just a loss of human communities and history. The landscape itself is changing, and it's only going to get worse. I wonder how much of this glen will be washed away as the winters get milder and the rain increases even more. I'm carrying that awe and that sorrow with me on this trail. I've now reached the top of the pass. The cold wind has disappeared and the clouds lifted above the peaks. I find a spot by the river to sit in the sun and snack on my lunch. Behind me lies Glencoe, the outlines of mountains and ridges I'm so familiar with. I can now see down towards Glenetiv and the hills on the other side. The trail starts descending, and I'm following another river. Rowan trees grow in the curry, and the water gathers in crystal clear pools with cascading waterfalls. I reach an open woodland, small native trees protected from grazing deer by a high fence. Near the bottom, the trail veers to the left and starts moving upwards again, towards the second pass. The ascent is steeper here than on the other side and makes me walk slower. Every few steps, I turn around to marvel at the view down Glen Etif. At the far end lies Loch Etif, a sea loch that connects to the ocean down by Connell near Oban. The sun is shining in the glen and lights up parts of it, while others remain in the shade. 
The light dips the mountains in a metallic shimmer, the wet rock reflecting the rays back towards the sky. The loch and the river leading towards it are silver, like mercury. As I climb higher, the light changes, and I notice a veil of rain moving up the glen. Time to pick up the pace. But of course, it's impossible to outrun the weather in the mountains. And as I reach the cairn marking the second pass, the clouds engulf me. Luckily, it's not more than a drizzle, and within a few minutes, the rain has stopped. In its stead, the glen reveals yet another miracle of nature to me. At first, it is faint, almost imperceptible to the eye. But as the sun gains back its strength and warms up my neck, colours become more saturated. There's a rainbow ahead of me, and it's a complete one. I can see both ends like a magical bridge connecting the mountains left and right of me. If I had more time, I could probably find two pots of gold. But time is a luxury in the mountains at this time of the year. I packed my headlamp, but I'd really rather not use it. And so I push on. It's all downhill from here. Before I know it, I'm back at the road. It's not far now to the car park where I set out this morning, but it's still a few miles to go. Down here in the glen, the path is boggy. Every few steps, my foot gets stuck in the black mud. And every couple of metres, I have to jump from one grassy island to the next, hoping that it won't give way beneath my feet. I'm pretty good at spotting the most treacherous patches of bog, but you can never know for sure. Clouds are moving in and out of the glen, and cars are flying past me on the nearby road. I reach the final river that I have to cross in order to get back to my car, and wade across, feeling the wet water seep into my boots once again. Sitting in my boot, wearing fresh socks, and holding a cup of tea, I watched the last rays of sunlight tickling the top of the hills. Glencoe will always hold a special place in my heart. It's the place where I fell in love with Scotland, the place where it all began. you enjoyed this story about Glencoe and the mountains that make me fall in love with Scotland over and over again. Our Patreon supporters will soon hear more about this walk and listen to some field recordings with additional stories about Glencoe and some bits of the hike that I couldn't fit in the story. If you'd like to hear that too, head to wildforscotland.com forward slash support and find out how to support the show. That's wildforscotland.com forward slash support. Now, let's take a quick detour and hear a word about our sponsors. Hello, Wild for Scotland listeners. I am Fran Tarowskis, and if you enjoy the storytelling episodes of Wild for Scotland, I want to tell you about another podcast in the Trembula Network. Seize Your Adventure is for people who want to explore the whole spectrum of adventure. But Seize Your Adventure is more than an adventure sports podcast – because all of the guests and storytellers throughout the series live the adventure lifestyle whilst also living with epilepsy. You'll get to hear stories about long-distance hiking, skiing in snowstorms and camping under the stars, but there are interviews that dive into the hidden aspects of taking on adventures with epilepsy. So if you're after a podcast that inspires, entertains and encourages you to take part in the adventure lifestyle, search for Seize Your Adventure in your podcast app to find out more. And we're back. Now it's time for the practical part of the show. Here are five travel tips for a trip to Glencoe. Tip number one, explore off the beaten path. Glencoe is without a doubt one of the most visited places in Scotland. Many people drive through the glen on their way north to Fort William, Loch Ness or the Isle of Skye. 
In fact, during the summer months, it's almost impossible to get parked up at the car parks throughout the Glen, because there are so many cars and tour buses stopping here. But despite that, it's actually pretty easy to explore Glencoe off the beaten path. One option is to put on hiking boots and set out on one of the many walks and hiking trails in the Glen. I'll share some of my favourite walks and viewpoints in this week's newsletter. And don't worry, you don't necessarily have to hike nine miles for all of them. Make sure you subscribe via the link in the show notes. Tip number two, learn about the cultural and natural heritage of the Glen. Glencoe is not just pretty, it's also brimming with history and has a fascinating landscape. Two great places to learn about the history and the nature of Glencoe are the Glencoe Folk Museum in the village and the Glencoe Visitor Centre that is run by the National Trust for Scotland. Tip number three. If you're keen for a more challenging day in the hills, hire a hiking guide. The mountains of Glencoe should never be underestimated, and so it's always safer to hire a hiking guide if you're new to these hills or plan a walk a little outside your comfort zone. My go-to guiding company in Glencoe is Girls on Hills. They've taken me up Buckalitif Big, across the Anach Igak Ridge, and to the Devil's Staircase on a navigation course. They run navigation and trail running weekends for women, but are also available for private guiding for mixed groups. Tip number four, stay a few nights. Another great way to enjoy Glencoe without the crowds is to spend a few nights in the area. That way you can visit popular locations early in the morning or later in the day when the buses have gone. Over the years, I stayed in many amazing places in Glencoe, from the King's House Hotel at the entrance to the Glen, to Scorrybreck B&B in the village, or the luxury cabins at Woodlands Glencoe. I'll pop links to all these in the full show notes on our website. And finally, tip number five. Use my Glencoe travel guide to plan your trip. Head over to my Scotland travel blog, watchmesee.com, and use the search bar at the top to find my Glencoe travel guide. It's full of practical tips, my favourite viewpoints and hikes, other things to do in the village, and more recommendations for places to eat and stay. You'll also find the link in the show notes. And with this, I send you off to plan your own trip to Glencoe and maybe fall in love with Scotland all over again as well. Next week, we're speaking with Adam Raja, who recommended this walk to me. We'll talk about his journey to the mountains, his connection with Glencoe and his work as a climate advocate. I hope you'll tune in again. Thank you so much for listening to Wild for Scotland. From the start, this has been an independently produced show and a passion project of mine, if you will. So if you enjoyed this episode, and want to help us reach even more listeners, consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts today. I love reading your feedback, and reviews really help others find the show. Wild for Scotland is part of the Tremula Network, adventure and outdoor podcasts off the beaten path. The show is written and hosted by me, Cathy Kamleitner. Thanks to Fran Tarowskis, who is the co-producer and editor, and does the sound design. Podcast art is by Lizzie Vaughan Knight, the Tartan Trailburner, and all original music is composed by Bruce Wallace. Until next time, when we travel to a different place in Scotland.